Hey guys, today we're gonna learn how to tame a kitten. We're reading Kitten Taming, uh, Train Your Cat's Inner Tiger by David Taylor. Um, so we're not gonna, it's thick, so we're not gonna get very far and I'm gonna throw in some other things that have worked with training our cat Katniss um, and some unique things that have worked with training our cat Baxter that will not be covered in here. So I'm not calling it the book's name. I'm just gonna put that in the description because we're not going by the book. We're kind of doing our own thing. And we're also going to be using the internet for some examples. Because Baxter is no ordinary cat. He is part dog, people have told me. He likes swimming. And he, so let's, let's do this as an intro video to Baxter. And then we'll go into the intro of the book. Okay, Baxter, we adopted. Um, I was volunteering at an animal shelter in Gillespie County, and I had been volunteering there for a couple of months. And every time I would come home, I would tell my husband, Aaron, at the time, Ricardo on YouTube is how he would prefer to be called. We'll still respect that. <laughs> Ricardo. So, um, cause I had a pen name. My pen name was to go by my maiden name, which is Stack, which is what I am now. Um, everywhere but my passport basically is stuck in one credit card. Um, everything else is in my old, everything else is in my maiden name again. Um, but my passport and one credit card are still in my, my ex-husband's last name. So, um, <coughs> so I would come home and I would, uh, because he deprived me of the children that I was promised, I would come home with pets. So he said, like, when I was looking for another volunteer opportunity, because um, he kept accepting these promotions and making too much money that I didn't really need to work anymore. So he told me that I could focus on writing and whatever else. So basically he got me down to hardly any income or jobs. And then he decided to divorce me because he's a fucking winner, guys. Fucking winner. I know it was not like on purpose that it was planned that way. It just happened that way. But it's just fucking frustrating that like he walked away literally with our RV that we had our home we had built together. Um, he now has our dog. Um, he's engaged, the motherfucker, to this fucking bitch he's been dating for like six fucking months. Just met her off the fucking internet. Um, divorce hasn't even been finalized for a year. Sorry. I, like, I, I wrote her a letter today. I'm not going to read it to you guys, but I, I fucking hate her. <laughs> I don't. I don't. It's mean. Like, I'm happy for I just, it's too fast. It's stupid. He's got a lot of shit he needs to work on. Neither one of us is ready for marriage. I am not even ready to date anybody right now, but he made sure he was dating someone. Seriously, he told me like two months after our divorce was finalized, which is just irresponsible. And the fact that this fucking hoe bag agreed to this, agreed to marry him when he's fresh out of divorce, has a whole bunch of fucking shit he needs to work on. Like, she does not sound like a picnic. She sounds like a nightmare. She sounds like a manipulative, controlling bitch. I'm sure she's not because Aaron is a good guy and he wouldn't propose to a manipulative, crazy, psycho bitch. But at the same time, she's luring him with sex or she's pregnant. Because I, this is not, this is out of his character. It doesn't make any sense. So I don't, she bewitched him. Maybe she's a witch. Maybe she cast a fucking spell on him. I don't fucking know. But I'm going to talk shit about her because this is my YouTube channel. And I just, I don't feel like being Christian right now. Like, I'm sorry it's Christmas, but I'm pissed. And I, I have a fucking, whatever. You know what? No, we're not. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to do this. I will do this. Maybe not right now. Maybe later on, because this is supposed to be about my cat. So let's bring it back and focus on that, guys. Okay. I don't even know how we got on the tangent of the other Chelsea. That here, yeah, her, her name is the same as mine, guys. Spelt the same fucking way and everything. We just have different middle names and last names. And now she's going to be the next Chelsea Coulterschlan. So basically I've been replaced with another fucking Chelsea, which is so fucking weird. Who the hell is he thinking about when he's doing shit with her? That's gross, Erin. You're disgusting. You couldn't find anybody fucking else with some other fucking name? Like, ew. Ew. Okay. So coming into backs. All right. Um, Baxter, we, so we moved into our RV full time, our, um, Jayco J flight what was a 2017 Jayco J flight. And we lived in it full time during COVID because we paid off like $48,000 of debt in like 
six years, something like that, through Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University. I should really do something on Dave Ramsey, you guys, because he's freaking genius. And, like, we we did not follow it to a T. We kind of took the guide and made it our own because we're rebellious, creative people. And we don't always follow rules. But we we did it how it worked for us. We took the program and we, we did it. I was very anti-cash everything. Dave Ramsey is very pro. Okay, this is the complete. Anyway, we'll talk about, we'll do a Dave Ramsey thing some other time. But we were, we are successful Dave Ramsey um, people. Um, paid off $48,000 of student loan debt. I, no, 8000 I had $8,000 of student loan debt. Aaron Ricardo had um, $20,000 of student loan debt and about uh, $20,000 $20, of um, credit card debt that I married into and fucking paid for, helped paid for, for too fucking long. And I should have asked for that in my stupid divorce, whatever. I, I, we just put everything on the U. We didn't want to deal with lawyers. We made it as easy and simple and painless as possible. But looking back now in hindsight, knowing that he's replacing me with another Chelsea, I feel like I should have fucking asked for more. I really do. Like, I really do. Instead of dipping into my fucking 401k and my Roth IRA and my IRA for a year. And then I have, like, no retirement now. But whatever. Anyway. So... And I'm making YouTube videos for free and people said that I should start charging and I don't know how to do that. And I looked it up and it, you know, it's complicated. I need a lot of subscribers. So subscribe guys. 18 is not enough. Apparently I need like a thousand in order to get money on YouTube, which is horseshit. Because if I would have taken this shit to TikTok, I would have been fucking, I would have had a lot more money. All I'm saying YouTube, like be more like TikTok. Okay. So we're going to talk about kitten taming and we're going to focus on Baxter. If you've seen friends, you know what that means. If you don't, this is what it means. Okay, so basically, we I fell in love with this cat. So I have this thing, it's I call it my spark. So, like Aaron and I, when we would be shopping for like a big purchase or an important thing, and like I said, this is probably gonna happen when we have these decisions. Like, I've always had this like spark for like people and animals and whatever. Like, I, I have like this connection and I click and like I feel something and like I know right away like something's gonna happen with this eventually and like sometimes it's slow sometimes whatever like very rarely have I had feelings for another human being that did not have feelings for me back um whether it be friendship whether it be anything like even even if it's just for a brief short not very long thing I just I don't I don't know I have like it's like a sixth sense or something I call it my spark so my spark so I told Aaron like fine, I will volunteer at this animal shelter and that will give me my fix and I won't feel like I need to bring home another pet. So, um, so we had a cat and we had a dog and that was, that was enough. That was enough. We decided we are not growing our family with any more pets. If we're growing our family, it's going to be with human children that we're adopting from foster care. So, um, he changed his mind about that during COVID. And, um, after about seven years of marriage, no, it was eight years of marriage because it would have been nine years of marriage in September. So it would have been eight years of marriage. We were just over eight years of marriage when we filed for divorce. So, but it was like seven and a half when he decided he he did not want a family with me. So, um, so screw him for lying to me and himself. And now he thinks he's going to marry some. Okay, we're not, we're not doing this. We're not doing this. We're not doing this. Motherfucker. Okay, so Baxter. Um, I, I meet him at the animal shelter. I met many, many animals and I would tell Aaron like, oh, this one's so cute. Like he's got it, such a good story. Like, I really hope he finds a home, whatever. And like that, that would be the end of it. I wouldn't say that I want them to, to be part of our family. Nothing. So, um, then one day I got the spark for Bax. So I'm volunteering at the animal shelter and like, I like pick up Bax. And like immediately, like I like feel this like connection with him. Like he's going to be, he's going to be ours someday. Like he's going to be significant in our life somehow someday. So Bax, like, I don't like, I would, we would like, we would test drive. So that how this all started is we were test driving vehicles to buy a car together. And so, um, I would, I would tell Aaron, like, 
yeah, it's got all the features. It's the right price, like good mileage, but I don't feel a spark. It doesn't feel like home. And he would be like, what? And he's like, car shopping is not a feeling, Chelsea. It's like a logical thing. I'm like, no, I agree with you. I was like, I agree with you 100%. But at the same time, I need to feel comfortable in the vehicle. I need to feel like like it's mine. Like, th like this is supposed to be my car. So like I have not purchased a vehicle. Like it took me three weeks to find my Spark car, which is a 2005 Jeep Liberty with a shitty paint job and 190,000 miles. But I got a Spark for it and it had all the features that I wanted and like under 200,000 miles. Like it was literally like my last resort Spark car versus like all the other, like I didn't, I didn't get a Spark for any of the other vehicles. Like one, I almost did, but he would not budge on price. So I was, I can't. So this is the cheapest SUV I could find, whatever I got it. And so, um, so, so I would, I would tell him about this like spark. I was like, you have to have, like, you sit in it. You have this feeling like when you touch the steering wheel and like you put the seatbelt on, like it feels like it's your car. Like it's home. It's, it's, a, there's like a spark, like a connection to you in this like vehicle. And so I was like, and I don't feel it with this car. This is not our car. And so like that, so that, that was, I was always the decision maker as far as the spark was concerned for a vehicle that I was going to be driving more than 50% of the time. Like when we bought his truck, I like, he, he twice drove a lot of trucks. And so it, it came down to the end. I was like, do you feel a spark for it? Does it feel like home? Does this feel like a car? You, he's like, do you want to sit in and feel a spark? I was like, no, because this is you, this is your car. Like you have to feel the spark. And so like, he, like, he didn't understand the spark company has, but before this, he just had hand-me-down cars and like, it wasn't like he, he, he had no, like he had, he came from a family with lots of kids. He did not shop for vehicles. Like he just got hand-me-downs from siblings, whatever. So like, so like he, he, I think he felt a spark for this truck that he ended up buying, which is the truck that we got so we could tow our RV. So anyway, so I like, I'm playing with this cat and I'm like, I'm sending Aaron pictures and normally I don't send him pictures of the pets that I like, like, or fall in love with there. And I'm just like, Aaron, like this cat, I have a spark for it. And then it's just like, he has blue eyes just like you. And he has orange hair and Aaron had red hair. And I was like, Ricardo had red hair. And I was like, he's like, he's like your biological cat son. Like we have to take him home and have a spark for him. And like, I'm like going on and he's like, no, no, do not bring that cat in our house. This is why you're supposed to volunteer at the animal shelter. So you don't bring pets home. You just lay with them there then you leave he's like put the cat down like don't touch it you don't have a spark for it like don't touch it at all and I was like no nope no Aaron like this is supposed to be our cat like it's he's like he's gonna be our child and like I like telling him like trying to convince him of this like cat and he's like no this is not our cat Chelsea there's no spark like we're not bringing no do not bring that cat home like he just kept saying do not bring him. I was like but how can you say no to these eyes how can you say no to this face and I kept sending all these pictures he's like easy no easy no he just kept saying it and I was just like but he's but I have a spark for him Aaron and then he's just like don't bring it home Chelsea do not bring the cat home so like I had like a a dentist appointment or a doctor's I had some kind of like health appointment I don't even remember it might have been dermatologist actually I don't remember so I go to my appointment and I like I'm driving back from my appointment and I text like my like the staff member that I volunteer with at the animal shelter. I'm like, is that orange kitty with the blue eyes still available? And she's like, yeah. Did you convince your hubby? And I was like, no. And he's like, you told me not to bring him home. But I was like, but I was like, can we foster him for like a week? And I was like, because then I'm technically not bringing him into our house as our, I'm not adopting him. I'm just bringing him as like a trial basis to see if it's going to be a good fit because he has to obviously approve this pet before it comes into our home. So like, She's like, yeah, yeah, that's a good idea. And then she's like, I think he's going to have a hard time saying no because he's so cute and sweet and blah, blah, blah. He's so friendly and like playful. And I'm like, I know, I know, I know. So like, I was not trying to be with you guys. I swear to God, I was not trying to be manipulative. But like, I couldn't not bring this cat home. I had a spark for it and it was like adorable. And so like, I bring it home. Like literally, like, I walk into the RV door and Aaron just shakes his head because he sees me with a little crate. And like Ty, our dog was like attacking the crate, like sniffing it and like licking it like he's so excited like you brought me another sibling like I'm so happy and like Katniss our cat was like hell to the no do not bring that freaking thing in here like she was not happy so like Aaron wasn't happy about it and Katniss wasn't happy about it day one 
day one, like Aaron, like Ty and I were super enthusiastic and excited and welcoming as pets. Like 50% of the household is in love with Baxter, 50% not so much. And we didn't, we did not name him anything. We named him Foster. He was Foster because he was a foster kitty and we weren't keeping him. So whatever. So I was like, well, maybe that's the spark is the spark is we're just supposed to foster him for a little while and then send him to his next home. Like we're just going to be fosters for him and like get him adjusted to life with a dog and cat and like we'll help him grow and it'll be whatever. And so I'm trying to like find like the benefits for the cat that he's going to get out of it because I'm not going to get him as my cat is like what I went in with this as. So I tried to like keep that attitude throughout the whole thing. And so basic, but like in my heart, like I just, I felt like there was more for this cat and our family. So, um, so this was, we brought, so he was born in September. I met him in October and we brought him home in October. And then, um, I think like we were in transitional period between the RV park and our friend's driveway to go to visit our family in Wisconsin for like a month. So Baxter, um, he, Candace warmed up to him. First of all, Candace warmed up to him last, but she warmed up to him within three days. And I, I'm told that's actually really fast for cats, that it's actually really hard for them to get along. But I, I don't, I'm, I'm good with animals. So like we, we just, we kept working on it and I kept easing her into it. And if she hissed or like, like got angry, I would like get in her face and like blow air in her face and tell her that's not acceptable behavior. She does not hiss at the new kitty. She does not hiss at me. She does not scratch the new kitty. She does not scratch me. So like I stopped it like before it even really started. So, um, so I kept like keeping Baxter safe, but then I kept like making sure I was spending time with Katniss and like making sure our household was run the way it was normally run and nothing changed in anybody's routine. We just had this like house guest <coughs> in our home that we were like being kind to. And I kept telling both pets, I was like, this is not your brother. This is just your foster brother. Like he's just temporary. <coughs> we don't know how long we're going to have him for. We haven't decided if he's going to be part of our family or not. So like Baxter favorite person up until this year was Aaron was Ricardo so he like I don't know if because he saw this other human being with the same color eyes and hair as his fur and eyes I have I have no idea I have no idea but like he he would sit on Aaron's lap while Aaron would work on his computer, because we both worked from home, he would sit on his lap and work on his computer and like curl up and be like super sweet and whatever. And like that, that was like his, like his, his place. First thing in the morning, he would, he would snuggle with me all night long. He'd sleep on my chest. That was like our thing was that night I got him on my chest and we'd snuggle in the morning. And then he would hop off the bed, hop off wherever. And he would hop on Aaron's lap and he would sit there literally for eight hours like he would stretch a couple of times he maybe get up and get some food and water go to the bathroom but then for the most part he just sat on Aaron's lap literally the whole time like Aaron was his favorite freaking person during the day I was his favorite person at night so like anyway so then um so a week goes by I'm frustrated because Candace is like she's taken to Baxter but like with boundaries like she would like sit by him but like if he's tried to snuzzle snuzzle her like nuzzle her or get anywhere like closer than like a couple inches to her she would like like she would make this noise and, and then they got to a point um before she ran away and then passed away um he would he would come up to her and he would put his entire body on top of her and she would make that like angry like growling sound but he would just hold her tighter and squeeze her tighter. Like, you're not going to push me away. Like, I'm going to love you so hard. Like, Bax is, like, the biggest freaking heart, you guys. Like, he, he, like, anyway, he, he does much better in a house with another dog, a cat, and a family. Like, he, he's super friendly. He is not, like, I've taken him. So, he is emotionally he is an emotional support pet certified now. And um, if you want to learn how to do that, I can explain that in like another video. It's actually a really easy process and it's under $100 to do it all. Um, so basically, he, he can go with me anywhere. And if we move to an apartment, 
so that we we are recently EMS certified, emotionally support pet or ESP certified, emotionally support pet certified. So it happened in November or October, October. Um, and everything's been kind of finalized in November. So I've been slowly taking him to places and like testing to see how he does. And like, he's gone to indoor events. He's gone to outdoor events with kids, without kids, with old people, with, with, adults with teenagers and he everybody is welcome to touch him everybody's welcome to play with him he has no issue he has no issue with other pets like he's literally like the chillest easygoing cat ever and he loves the water which is rare for cats and we live on a sailboat and he has jumped in a couple times not very often he's a good swimmer um yeah he's he's very good cat he just has been having these um these issues with i don't know misbehavior since we got back from Wisconsin. He did not really have these issues like before that. Like he peed a couple times in places he wasn't supposed to be. We found out he had blood because he has feline urinary tract disorder, I think it's called, or illness. Um so he has to be on like prescription medication now. Not well he did to clear the infection out, but now he's just on prescription pet food. So it's like fifty dollars a month at the pet store at like the vet. I think if you go on Chewy or, or PetSmart's website, it's supposed to be cheaper, but I have to pay extra to get things shipped because I have a mail forwarding address um, as my as my mailing address. So I have to pay iPostal to get my mail and my packages and it's expensive to get packages. So if I can avoid getting a package, I do that. Um, and cat food is going to be a big package, which means I'm going to have to pay like $5 just to get it, which means it's not worth me shipping, like getting less so I can pay the shipping fee and then pay my like mail retrieval fee. Like it's, it's stupid. So I, I don't even bother, but okay. So back to Baxter. So, um, that was October. Then we take him, um, so basically I, I'm saying we like we need to leave tomorrow um, to go to Wisconsin. So we need to make a decision today about what we're doing with Baxter. We've had him for a whole week. And then I, I told Ricardo, my ex-husband, I was like, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take him back. Um, we fostered him for a week. It's not a good fit. It's not working out for our family. And he's like, what? He's like, he's a perfect fit for our family. And then he's like, he's like, what are you talking about? I was like, well, Canada doesn't really like him still. And he's like, they, they've, they've, they've like they've improved so much. Like she, she goes right next to him now. Like that happened in just a few days, Chelsea. Like you, like you got to give him more time than that. You got to give it. And he's like, he's like, he's like, if you take him, I like, I'm going to cry. Like I'm going to be heartbroken. Like he's part of our family now. And I'm like, okay. I was like, so I'm taking him to the shelter to adopt him then today instead of returning him. And he's like, yeah, that would be good. <laughs> okay. So the guy didn't want me to read all this cat like in love with him so like and I think Baxter like knew he knew where he wasn't wanted and he like he forced himself to be to be wanted by those people by by Candace and by Aaron he like found a way to like like I I tried helping it along but that was all Baxter Baxter I give full credit to Baxter for winning over Aaron and Candace like not worthy so anyway so Baxter um, goes to, I go, I, we adopt him. He gets his like, um, I have this microchip and whatever else like set up. And then we like scheduled an appointment to get him neutered, which I think we had to wait like six months or something like that. And so we take him to Wisconsin. So we didn't really do training with him that whole week. And then we were in a car for several days. Um, and then in our RV for a month and like busy with family and friends in Wisconsin and my birthday and Thanksgiving and Aaron's dad got diagnosed with pancreatic cancer and he was dying. So like there was just like, it just, we didn't, training didn't happen in November. And then December we get back, we get back late because we stayed in Wisconsin later because Aaron's dad was dying and we didn't know how much time we were going to have with him. So we, we prolonged our trip so we could spend more time with Aaron's dad. And so we could spend more time with family, whatever. So like, he didn't, and then we get back and we're like rushing to get stuff ready for Christmas and we're in a new RV park and we're trying to get settled and whatever. And this RV park had lots of activities and stuff going on that I wanted to be involved in. They had like weekly poker nights. I love playing poker. So like we did these weekly poker nights and then they had like paint and set parties and I love painting and drawing. So we did, I did, so I, I participated in like everything that was available to me basically. And then 
it like, and we were just, we were busy. I was working at the time, copy editing manuscripts for a book publishing company. And so like, I was busy with that. Then I was teaching yoga classes. Like there was, I was working and busy then. So like, um, and then we had holidays. So it just like, it just, it training didn't happen really in December. And then Aaron announced that he wanted to get a divorce, um, the week of Christmas and we filed for divorce the day after Christmas and then um kind of focused on that so he didn't really get trained for that and then it was me like bouncing around to different people's houses so I wasn't living in Aaron's RV because we decided he was gonna buy the RV for me and I was gonna buy a different RV and like it just like it basically like the year just became one traumatic crazy thing after another and training just did not happen with our cat. So I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that. Something happens when you get a new pet that you didn't plan for. There's a death in the family or maybe you had a new baby or whatever. Like sometimes pets, just the training thing that you had done with previous pets just doesn't happen. So Baxter was the divorced child and he like, he just, he was surviving. And basically we were training him as a reaction to any bad behavior. So instead of proactively setting him up to be successful and training him the way we did with Candace with this cat kitty taming book, like we got her, we did everything right. We did everything by the book. We looked up things, we researched things. We tried all these different things and Candace was trained. She was good to go. So basically Baxter learned how to how to be like how to be a well-trained cat and have good behaviors from his sister by watching her so like he was very he was a very good follower she was a very good leader they they had a really good relationship and it's just um he lost her and he lost Aaron who was like his favorite human and then he loses Ty and then he gets into a car accident with me where his head was out the window when the car was coming towards us which was very traumatic and terrifying. I, I still don't know how he ended up underneath the seat. I literally thought he got killed by the car. So like, I just like, it's a miracle that it happened that he had instincts or God or an angel or someone protected him. I have, I have no idea, but I'm very grateful that I still have my cat. So like, I know now that the spark that I had for Baxter was that he was supposed to be he was supposed to be like for me. He was supposed to be like my savior in all of this craziness, like my emotional support pet going through this nutso year, losing Katniss, losing Ty, losing Aaron, losing our RV, like losing another RV. Like eventually we're going to be selling this boat and moving back to Wisconsin and then hopefully to Europe. And like, I like, it's just, I, so I'm grateful for Baxter, but he's, he drives me freaking bananas. Honestly, like he, he has decided that he wants to eat the second he's up. It doesn't matter if it's four in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's two in the morning. It doesn't matter if it's a few hours after he ate already. When he's hungry, he wants to eat. And if he doesn't get his food, he knows that it makes me angry and that he gets my attention if he pees on my rugs. Instead of the litter box, he knows to go in the litter box. Um, there's been a couple of times where he's peed on my bed. He's peed in, I have these like cloths um, bins for my clothes. He pees in these. He pees in there. He'll sit in the clothes and, and go to the bathroom. He'll pee at the edge of my bed in my, I don't know if I've given you, I've done a Facebook tour. I don't know if I gave you guys a tour. So like he'll go in the corner. So I have like a triangle bed cause it's in a boat. Um, but he'll go in the corner and he'll just, he'll pee there. He'll pee wherever the hell he feels like he pees on these rugs. They're super dirty. They smell like urine because he pees on them all the time. They're his favorite spot. But he's got this nice, clean litter box that I take. Like, it's just so aggravating, you guys. So, like, what we decided to do in the meantime was because he he wakes up when my alarm goes off at 7 every day. So, he knows that I'm going to get out of bed, that I'm going to get ready and go to the bathroom and feed him when the alarm goes off. So, I decided to set a dinner alarm as well. So he, every time he hears that sound, he knows, like I purposely for any other alarm I set, I change it to a different ringtone because I want him to, to strike that as like his, his meal ticket, like his dinner bell. Every time that cell phone goes off at that time, it's time for him to eat. So, and then I make like a big deal about it now. So like, even though I'm like exhausted in the morning or I'm tired in the evening, whatever, like second that thing goes off, I'm like, it's time to eat Max. 
And like we get all excited. He runs to his like little bowl and like we get it out. So that's our thing. So 7 a.m. and 5 p.m. twice a day, he gets a fourth a cup of his special diet cat food um, for his, his feline urinary tract disease. Um, so, so he, so that's been working. The problem is he still is punishing me if he doesn't eat when he thinks it's time to eat. So like he, the alarm has not been, if the alarm goes off, I feed him. Like, doesn't matter what I'm doing, what's happening. I feed him when the alarm goes off as long as I'm home. Yesterday I got home late. So he didn't eat until late and he only had one accident, but like it was my fault because I got home late. And so he ate late. So it, it's, that's on me. But this morning, he woke up 10 minutes before the alarm went off and he started knocking over my jewelry and like scratching crap he's not supposed to. And then he, I heard him scratching at the, at the carpet and I was sure enough, he peed on the freaking carpet again. So I've like washed these, like, I don't, I don't even like bother. Now I just like, I take like a washcloth and I like, spat it down. I spray it with some freaking Febreze. I know there's like other things you can do, but it's like literally every other day he's peeing on these rugs and I can't keep up anymore. And I don't, I don't have like a washing machine on my boat and I'm not going to take everything to the, to the laundromat once a week, every, like not it, like it would be like every other day I'd be going to the laundromat, just wa- like spend multiple quarters and money just to wash two little rugs. Like it doesn't make any sense. So like nobody has been coming in our boat. Like it's, whatever. So like I have no company. So we just, we deal with the smell because I I don't know what else to do anymore. So we have been like, we just, we uh, will pat it down with a a dirty washcloth that just soak it in water and some soap and just clean it, spot clean it basically. And then spray it with Febreze because I have have no idea what else to do. So he, he's still doing that. It's still very (laughs) aggravating. And so like, yeah, so I just, I'm just, I'm done. I'm frustrated. I'm sick of smelling. <laughs> and I have essential oils that I could just plug in and easily fill the room, which I probably will do soon. It's just half the outlets on the boat don't work. There's like eight outlets. Four of them work. Everything on the left side works. Everything on the right side does not. I don't know why this is. Uh, Captain Day D was going to help me with it. And it has not, it has not been fixed yet. So, um, we're going to get started. I'm going to show you guys back, which we've seen him many times before, but he's cozy and cute right now. Maxie, you say hi? You say hi, sweet pea? Okay. So we're going to get into the introduction. Do you want to plug this? Yeah. I know. I am plugged in. Sorry. I just blamed you for nothing. Disregard that, Max. Okay. All right. So we're going to get into this book, Kitten Taming. And we'll see how far we get. And then I'm just going to pause it and, like, show you things that I have for Baxter that have to do with this um, that we got for Candace or new for him or whatever. And we'll just go from there. So it's not going to be, like, a normal reading. It's going to be more, like, I don't know, hands-on, personal experience, whatever. Call it whatever you want. Okay. Introduction. If you have already bought a new kitten into your house, into your home, or plan to do so soon congratulations often underestimated and undervalued cats make the most interesting entertaining and attractive of all pets if your new cat is to show you the many (coughs) facets of his character and ability however he needs to be properly domesticated educated and trained the ancient wild prowling hunter that still lurks within all cats has to be tamed and this is where you will play a vital role as this book will explain Most importantly, your well-trained pet will definitely live longer. Bring up your kitten properly and he will be far less likely to go roaming around the neighborhood, thereby getting into trouble by picking up ailments and injuries. (coughs) All the longest living cats I have ever met had been thoroughly trained and successfully tamed by their loving owners. (coughs) As you come to understand your kitten's thinking and motivation, you will be able to care for him in a much more comprehensive way than by simply putting down a dish of food and opening the back door when he wants to go out. The kitten will be happier, more content, and free from stress, while you will gain immeasurable and lasting pleasure in having this new family member in residence. There's a super cute photo of the cat, so I have to show you guys. Okay, so the funny thing is, is I was never a cat person growing up. My dad lied to us and said he was allergic, so we didn't get any cats. 
Um, so we always had dogs in our family. So I was comfortable with dogs, used to dogs. I only played with cats if they were like at a friend's house or whatever. But <clears throat> anyway, so um, but Aaron was a huge cat person. So he always said he wanted a cat or whatever. And I had a roommate with a cat. And that's kind of when I kind of crossed over to wanting a cat also. But I still love dogs. So I like both now. Um, and I will eventually be getting another dog sister for Baxter, but we're waiting until we're settled either in Wisconsin or Europe before that happens because I don't want to have more issues with another pet because we're not in a stable like situation yet. We don't know where we're going to be. We don't know what we're going to be doing. And until that happens, I'm not going to get a dog until we figure that out because I don't want to have another pet with behavioral issues. And Bax isn't a good place to be a good like example of how a a, a well-behaved, trained pet should be acting in our household. So until he acts like that, he's not getting a sibling. Okay, your amazing cat. Another cute cat photo. Okay, what is a cat? Hereditary. Heredity, heredity. Cats have been domesticated and kept by humans for thousands of years, both as companions and for their value as pest controllers. But all owners and potential owners should be aware that their cat is descended from a highly successful predator. Early history. The gorgeous little bundle of fur curled up on your lap is actually a member of a proud predatory series species. With a history that can be traced back to live five female cats that lived in the Near East some 130,000 years ago. One of your cat's wild relatives and one that is indistinguishable from him genetically is the African wildcat which can still be found living in all parts of Africa. Although the earliest form, firm evidence of cats being domesticated by humans comes from a 9,500-year-old grave in Cyprus where a cat was found buried beside a human, <clears throat> it probably began gradually about 12,000 years ago as hunting nomadic peoples settled down and started to farm. <coughs> With farming came the cultivation of grain and naturally grain stores. In due course, small wild cats began to move in from the countryside to prey <coughs> on the rats and mice that also relish grain. Humans quickly came to recognize the value of having such effective rodent operatives around. The cat status in human society changed dramatically some 6,000 years ago when Egypt, at that time the most important country of the Middle East, began then venerating these useful creatures as semi-divine aspects of the sun god Ra and the goddess of fertility Bast. Of course, even today, there are millions of people around the world, undoubtedly, including you and I, who in their own way continue to adore, if not venerate, their cats. <coughs> cat breeds. The development of the many different breeds of domestic cats were we see today came about through cat lovers gradually selecting and crossbreeding individuals from the ordinary domestic types that had been around for thousands of years. Although there are records of cat shows being held in England as early as the 16th century, breeding for show purposes did not really take off until the late 19th century. In 1871, a major show for Persian and British short hair types was held in London at the Crystal Palace and at about the same time, the first American cat show for Maine Coons took place in England. Okay, your kitten's fascinating body, feline physique. Your kitten may not look much like a lord of the jungle, but he is built with the same equipment as a tiger or a leopard. As an essentially predatory carnivore, now adapting to the easy life that awaits him in your family home, his body is still designed for life in the wild. Teeth. A cat's teeth are miniature versions of a lion's, and the space between the fangs, canine teeth, is again like a lion's, just right for them to be inserted precisely between two adjacent cervical vertebrae of his favorite prey, thereby breaking the neck. Where lion's fangs are spaced perfectly for killing gnus and zebras, your kitten's teeth are positioned with mice very much in mind. A cat's side and back teeth are designed for slicing meat, and grinding type chewing is not possible. Eyes. Although it's often said that cats can see in the dark, they cannot see in absolute darkness. However, in dim light, their eyes do work far better than ours do. This is not only because of the cornea, pupil, and lens of their eyes are relatively much larger than ours, but also because there is special glittery 
special light conserving sheet of glittering cells lying behind the retina, which acts as a sub superb mirror. This sheet is what gives your kitten's eyes a gold or green shine when they are caught in a light at night. Whiskers. It is thought that the whiskers are associated with touch and that they act as sensitive, fast-acting antenna in darkness. Some scientists think that cats can bend their whiskers downwards to help guide them when they are bounding over rough ground at night. Pause. Look closely at your kitten's feet. You will see that one pad, which lies behind and above the other pads, does not come into contact with the ground. Although it's not certain exactly what it does do, if it's not a shock absorber like the other pads when the cat moves around, it's thought that it is an anti-skinning device, which comes into play only when the cat lands from a jump. Okay. <clears throat> Sense and sensibility. The five senses. Their highly developed senses mean they even that even young kittens are perfectly equipped <coughs> to be aware of the world around them. Sight. A cat's eyes can cope with very low light levels, which is invaluable for a hunting animal. Their binocular vision, also important for hunters, which must judge the range of targets accurately, is better than that of dogs. It is now known that cats can see in colors, but they don't pay much attention to them. Hearing. All cats are able to locate the source of sounds as well as humans as a human can, but their hearing at high frequencies is far more acute than ours. Smell. Cats' noses give them a much better sense of smell than we have. Their nostrils contain about 19 million special sniff nerve endings, while we make do with only about 5 million. In addition, cats possess a strange little structure, J Jacobson's organ, in the roof of their mouth. This organ is involved in analyzing the chemical content of some odors, particularly sexual ones. When your cat occasionally makes a rather odd nose wrinkling grimace, which is known as phlegming, he is using his Jacobson's organ. You are most likely to notice this behavior when your cat investigates a patch of catnip in the garden or a trace of another cat's urine on the pavement. Taste. Cats are notoriously fuzzy eaters, more so than dogs. They do not have, they do have an acute sense of taste picked up by taste buds on the tongue and sent via nerve pathways up to the brain. It is used to be thought it used to be thought that cats had few, if any, sweet carrying nerves. But we know now that they do not that they do have some and that the numbers appear to be on the increase as cats are bred more and more to share our homes, habits, and inevitably sweet tidbits. Touch. A sense of touch <coughs> is also important to cats. And it's a sense that is clearly demonstrated in the way that sensually rub and bump, they sensually rub and bump against people, other animals, and inanimate objects. For a newborn kitten, blind, unable to smell, and with closed ears, a sense of touch is vital in responding to the vibrations produced by his purring mom, mother, when she summons him at feeding time. Nine lives. Landing first, feet first. It is often said that cats have nine lives. This odd idea probably arose because of the atmosphere, mystery, and the occult <coughs> that has been associated with these animals throughout the ages. All cats with their lithe bodies and physical skills seem to have the knack of escaping from tight corners and overcoming mishaps. And with perhaps a little luck, your new kitten will be able to look forward to a long life. The average lifespan of four pet cats is 15 years. Although many exceed this and a few celebrate their 20th birthdays. Balance. A precise sense of balance helps cats avoid or survive many perilous situations. Among nature's most accomplished tightrope walkers, they can, without actively considering matters, walk along the narrowest branch of the top or the top of a garden fence. They do this by means of unconscious information signals and commands, which link their eyes inner ears, and brains. You will notice that your cat's tail helps him balance, like the lawn pole carried by high wire arithes as he uses it as a counterbalance. Although even tailless breeds like the Manx seem to manage equally well. <clears throat> Falling. <laughs> the combination of eyes, ears, and brain also come into play if a cat falls from a height Working together, they compute and then correct the falling animal's body position so that first the head and then the trunk and legs are ultra quickly aligned to achieve a soft landing. Cats that fall from very high places 
are often less severely injured than cats that fall shorter distances. If a cat falls from a window of a building, the injuries it suffers increase progressively the higher the story, but only up to seven stories. If it falls <clears throat> from a window higher than that, the severity of the injuries actually begins to decrease. This is because after falling for a distance for of about five stories, the cat reaches maximum speed, which then remains constant. The inner ear mechanism is then no longer aware of any acceleration and switches off. The cat relaxes and spreads out his legs like a free fall parachutist. This stabilizes his descent. In addition, a relaxed body is much less likely to suffer from fractures than a tense one. Finding the way back home. What do we have here? Here's the next. Okay, so we have a few more pages and we'll stop because it's our... 45 minutes. Finding the way back home. A brilliant sense of direction. Cats possess a remarkable ability to find their way back home if they inadvertently get lost. There have also there ha, they have also been many reports of cats navigating their way back to their previous home when the family has moved. There are many reports of cats that have traveled astonishingly long distances in making their way back to a much loved family. A cat that traveled more than 1,400 miles from California to Oklahoma probably holds the record. Cat nav. Cats are thought to make these long journeys by celestial navigation. Your cat sits regularly in your garden and his brain subconsciously registers the angle of the sun in the sky at any given time of the day. He may be able to do the same thing at night by registering the position of the stars, like humans and many other animals, including even cockroaches. It is likely that cats have internal biological clocks in their brains and that they may also possess magnetic particles in some brain cells that function as compasses. When a cat is far away from his home, he notes that the sun's position is different at some particular hour and keen to get back to his favorite place and people. <clears throat> he starts to move. If when he travels in one direction, he finds that the angle of the sun differs to its angle when viewed from his home, he then turns and goes another way, whereupon the angle improves. In this way, by trial and error, the clever cat finds the correct direction and heads off, altering course as necessary from time to time. Once he is close to home with the sun now in its rightful place, familiar sights and sounds take over in guiding him home, moving home. This guidance system does not work if a cat is left behind for some reason when a family moves house. Then he cannot find the location of his family and the safety of his new home. So it is difficult to explain the well-known tale of William Shakespeare's patron, the Earl of Southampton, whose faithful cat tracked him down when he was imprisoned in the Tower of London and climbed down the chimney into his master's cell. Perhaps it was a form of feline sixth sense. <clears throat> Okay. What do cats think about? Oh, sorry. Here it is. What do cats think about? Feline deliberations. When your kitten is sitting gazing out the window, what is he thinking about? Does he wonder about the next can of food you are going to open for lunch or the big ginger tom that lives next door or whether he should move upstairs in search of a comfortable bed? Cats don't, in fact, sit and think about past events or speculate on the future, and they must never, therefore, be punished by their owners for something they did a short while ago. They simply won't understand. They are, however, highly skilled in acquiring information, retaining it in their memory banks, and then utilizing it to solve problems. Their powers of short-term recall have been shown to last for some 16 hours. In comparison, a dog's short-term memory lasts no more than five minutes. Some scientists believe that their skilled handling of the information they receive via their senses via their senses makes them the most intelligent of all companion animals, equal in intelligence to a two or three year old child. The here and now. Like humans, cats learn by seeing, by imitation, and by trial and error. And if they are really to remember something and store it in their long term memory, they must do rather than see it. When your cat has to be put in a cattery while you're away on holiday, he does not miss you. He doesn't sit around moping, <coughs> morosely wondering why you are no longer there and why he has been subjected to this imprisonment. His thoughts are on the here and now, the food, the staff, the sights, the smells and sounds of his new surroundings. He will spend his time reacting to them rather than daydreaming. Of course, thank goodness, when you do finally return and come to collect him, he immediately remembers you and makes a fuss of you. 
Second thing. <coughs> Historically, cats have frequently been associated with the supernatural, and nowadays they are still credited with strange powers. They are known, for example, to be able to predict the eruption of volcanoes, the imminence of earthquakes, and more mundanely, the arrival home of their owners from work. Certainly, their acute sensitivity to sounds and vibrations explains how they are able to predict volcanoes and earthquakes and possibly also their owners return in a car whose engine noise they recognize at a long distance. Nevertheless, the possibility remains that cats really do have some powers of telepathy. Okay. Sharp claws, sharp brain. Feline Einstein. People, particularly those who prefer cat dogs, often say that dogs are more intelligent than cats. However, their only reason for believing this appears to be that dogs are more easily trained and are compliant in responding to their owner's instructions. Cat lovers know better, of course. Cats can be trained, but trainability may not be a reliable indicator of intelligence. Many biologists consider that cats are highly intelligent, partly because of their notable adaptability to the ever-changing relationship they have had across the millennia with humans and partly because of their ability to take control of the events and situations they encounter as independent. Leading individuals rather than as creatures, they are obedient to the commands of others. This characteristic is not surprising in animals that are essentially solitary, self-reliant hunters equipped with an array of of state-of-the-art senses as well as an athletic physique. Measuring intelligence. Deciding if a cat is more intelligent than a dog will depend on how you try to measure intelligence. This has proved to be highly controversial even among scientists who are studying different groups within a single species, such as Homo sapiens. There is no reliable objective yardstick. One disputed method that has been used to make intelligence comparisons involves measuring the weight of the brain and the length of the spinal cord. This allows a ratio representing the quantity of brain matter controlling a particular amount of body to be calculated. Some scientists think that this ratio should be bigger than the more intelligent the animal. On this basis, a human gives a ratio of 50 to 1, a marmoset monkey, one of 18 to 1, a dog, one of between 9 and 1, and 7 and 1, depending on breed, and a cat, one of 4 to 1. Critics of this way of comparing species argue that there is much more to intelligence than anatomy and that it is, it is in essence, unweighable. I agree, and so respect... So I suspect I will will other cat lovers. If you look on the internet, you will find lists of cat breeds with their average intelligence graded from 1 to 10, with 10 being the most intelligent. According to one list of the brightest cat is that little baldy, the Sphinx, while the dimmest ones are the Himalayans and exotic short hairs. I have met some exceptionally sharp cats of the latter two breeds. No mention is made of how their conclusions were arrived at, and these unscientific lists should be regarded with a rather large pinch of salt. You know your cat is intelligent. You don't need a list to like this to prove it. Here, let's get in. My friend Sarah has one. They're actually really cute. Okay, your kitten's arrival. We will do next time. So cute. Okay. All right, guys. So we are going to finish. That is it for today. Um, we really didn't go into much training. I told you about the like food thing and we got into like Bax's whole like story. Um, so I think that's enough for today and we will get into the rest next time. Thanks for watching and listening. Bye.